In ecosystems, populations don't live by themselves. They actually interact with, each, with other populations, and that's called a community. A community is all of the populations of organisms living close enough together for interaction in a particular environment. Okay? The boundaries of the community can depend on what you're talking about. If you're, t if you're just talking about all the different animals and plants that live in your backyard, then that would be the limits of the community for that particular, um, for that particular study. You could also have a pond. You could also talk about the, about the uh, microbes that live in the intestines of a fish that live in the pond. There are lots of different ways to define a community, but basically you have all the different organisms that live and interact with each other in that particular environment. When we talk about um, communities, we also have to talk about various ways that the organisms interact with each other. And one way that we do that is to talk about the ways they compete with each other. Okay? An organism's use of the biotic and abiotic resources of its environment is called its niche or its niche. Okay? And this is basically like the occupation of the, of the organism within its habitat. A habitat is like the address where the organism lives and the niche or the niche is, is what it does within that, within that habitat. Okay? When you ha end up with competition, that's when you have the niches of two different populations that overlap with each other. And that can lead to various kinds of competition. They can be, they can work together, they can work against each other, all different kinds of the, things like that. One thing to keep in mind when you think about the pop, this in terms of populations is that competition is going to lower the carrying capacity of both of those uh, populations because the resources can't be available to both populations at the same time. There are various kinds of competitions that can occur within environments, okay? One type is mutualism. In mutualism, both populations benefit from the relationship with each other. They both get something out of the, out of the uh, relationship. In predation, you've got one species that kills and eats another. That's the predator kills and eats the prey. Commensalism is when you have one species that gets some benefit from the relationship, the other is neither harmed nor helped. And then the fourth kind is parasitism, and that's when you have a host that is victimized by parasites, parasites or pathogens. So let's look at some examples of all of those kinds of things. Okay, in mutualism, when you have some, you have uh, both species benefit for something. Here we see several different examples of of mutualism. Um, of course, a cute example up here from Finding Nemo, but we've also got this bird that actually picks the teeth of the of the crocodile, and the crocodile benefits because it gets all the stuff out of its teeth, and the bird benefits because it gets something to eat. This uh, tree down here is inhabited by ants that actually help protect the tree from other invaders, and the tree provides the um, the food for the for the ants. And even bees and flowers, okay, the bee gets the benefit of getting the pollen and getting the nectar to make the honey, but it also pollinates flowers, which gives, which provides for some, for some variety in the, in the gene pool of the, of the flower species. Another relationship is commensalism. This is when you have one organism that gets some benefit from the relationship and the other one is not really affected one way or the other. We see several examples here. At the top left we've got a shark with a remora. A remora is a fish that kind of hangs around with a shark and basically the remora can hitch a ride onto the shark and go from place to place and also eat the shark's leftovers. The shark isn't bothered one way or the other with the, with the remora. It doesn't eat the remora, it doesn't, um, it isn't bothered by it, and it doesn't, it doesn't really help it at all. The, um, you might wonder about this relationship. This is a, is a uh, polar bear that's got algae growing on it. Now polar bears have hairs that are hollow and that's part of their one of their adaptations that allows them to live in um, in the cold climates that they live in but when they live in warmer places that hollow hairs on their fur actually allow uh, is uh, provides a place for algae to live the algae gets the benefit of having the warmth and the um, and the um, water from the from the polar bear, but the polar bear is not either bothered nor uh, helped by the algae being there. Another example would be parasitism. Okay, in parasitism, you've got one organism that benefits and the other one is harmed. Uh, on the lower left, we see an example here of a type of fungus called the cordyceps fungus that actually uh, attacks. Um, 
of various kinds of insects and actually eats its way through their bodies and f eventually kills it and the, the insect's body provides food for the fungus to grow and reproduce. Okay, here we have a clutch of eggs with an extra egg of, of a different species in there, probably something like a cuckoo. Cuckoos oftentimes will lay their eggs in another bird's nest and let the bird, let the other bird um, hatch its own young and feed it. So there are lots of examples of parasitism in nature. All right, in predation, you've got uh, you've got a benefit for the predator, but but the prey gets killed in the process. Okay, here we have a type of snail. This is a this is a cuttlefish, and the cuttlefish is catching a, a little crab here and eating that. This shows that how the way the cuttlefish actually mesmerizes or kind of um, kind of hypnotizes its prey, uh, and prey have to adapt to protective structures of some kind or another, one of the very common things that they do is develop some kind of camouflage. They also various, they also have various mechanical defenses and chemical defenses that can help protect them from the predators. Um, here we have a, a seahorse. The seahorse has a, has a way of hiding out. This is in a, in a coral reef, okay, and there are actually little protuberances on the surface of the sea, seahorse that look like the coral polyps growing out of the coral. We have various uh, examples with insects. Here's a, a type of uh, moth that looks very much like leaves. Here's another moth that, that can blend in with the tree. Another uh, moth that looks like a flower there, okay? And then other kinds of insects. Here's an insect that, that's the same coloration as the flower it lives on. Here's a frog that blends into the tree there. And so there are lots of examples of, of those kinds of things in nature. Now when we talk about those relationships within a community, we have to talk about the feeding relationships. And these are called trophic levels. If you think about uh, trophic just means feeding. And so when we look at the sequence of the food transfer up the food, the trophic levels, we call that a food chain. And this is what this does is it recycles and moves the chemical nutrients uh, and energy through the trophic levels in a community from the producers to the primary and secondary and tertiary consumers. So the producers are autotrophs like plants um, that support all the other trophic levels. Uh, plants generally are the main source of food in terrestrial uh, ecosystems and aquatic ones it would be something like algae uh, but those are still a, a photosynthetic or an autotrophic organism that's going to provide the basis of the food chain. The consumers are the heterotrophs of various kinds and so we have we have primary consumers those are the organisms that eat the, the producers those are herbivores we have secondary consumers that eat the herbivores, tertiary consumers eat the secondary consumers, and quaternary consumers eat the tertiary consumers. And we think about that, it makes a very nice little chain. However, within that chain, most organisms don't eat just one thing. They actually, it depends on, they're uh, classified at different levels, of uh, primary, secondary, and so forth, depending on, on that particular thing that they've just eaten. Okay, here we have a couple of examples of food chains. A terrestrial food chain over here would begin with the plant and then the primary consumer of the plant in this case is a, is a grasshopper. When the mouse eats the grasshopper that ate the plant, that makes the mouse a secondary consumer. When the snake eats the mouse that ate the grasshopper that ate the flower, that makes the snake a tertiary consumer and then the hawk would eat the snake and that would make the hawk a quaternary consumer. That's the top level consumer. That doesn't mean that it eats everything else there. It just means when it eats that particular animal, it's at that level. Um, in an aquatic food chain, you have phytoplankton and algae that would be the producers in that food chain. The zooplankton, the animal-like protista that would eat the phytoplankton, that would be the primary consumers. The smaller fish like herring that eat the, that eat the zooplankton would be secondary consumers. The tuna which eat the herring would be a tertiary and the killer whale that eats the tuna would be quaternary. Uh, we can be classified at different levels depending on what particular source of our food happens to be at that time. Now there also are other organisms that are parts, parts of these feeding relationships that actually don't necessarily eat 
those particular things. And those are the detritivores and the decomposers. The detritivores eat the dead material that's produced at all trophic levels, the, the crumbs on the table, basically, the leftovers. The detritivores are the things that kind of eat what's left over. Decomposers are mainly prokaryotes and fungi, and they're going to actually digest molecules in those organic molecules and those organic materials and convert them into inorganic forms that can be used by them. And those are very important in making sure that we, that we recycle all of the energy and all the matter within the ecosystem. A food web is the, is the network of all the interconnecting food chains. Because remember, consumers can eat more than one type of producer, and then you've got several different consumers that feed on the same species of producer, not necessarily at the same time or in the same way. And so when we look at food chains and food webs, food webs in particular, remember the arrow shows the direction the energy is flowing from the producer to the consumer uh, and, and from the primary consumer to the secondary consumer and so forth. This particular um, diagram shows um, a series of feeding relationships in a an aquatic environment. So we've got our zooplankton and phytoplankton here at the bottom of the food chain. And there are seaweeds. We've got various kinds of primary consumers like crabs and fish, zooplankton, krill, and, and they can be eaten by and eat different things. Notice that we've noticed that the blue whale is the top of one particular chain, leopard seal is the top of another, and the killer whale is the top of another. And so it just depends on what, what, uh, the, what the particular animal is eating at the time that will determine whether it is a primary, secondary, tertiary consumer.